All right. I hope everybody is well. I thank you for joining me today. I am preparing for my um, meaning crisis video. I did a first installment of um, the meaning crisis, what crisis, which you can check out right up here or up here if you'd like. And I'm preparing for the second video. And I was um, thinking through and I'm working through these videos on the meaning crisis in regards to my experience because they're are a lot of wonderful videos out there from very smart people discussing kind of the overarching um, configuration of the meaning crisis, uh, especially Jean Verveke. And I wanted to kind of uh, parallel that with my experience in taking, uh, uh, getting a degree in political philosophy and in, in philosophy and kind of how I worked through that. But one of the books that had an impact on me while I was taking my first existentialism class at university was this book right here. is entitled Existentialism from Dostoevsky to Sartre. And um, this was the first time in this book I came across Heidegger and um, his question concerning being. Um, and I remember when I was reading that, it just uh, blew me away. I, I can, you know, you have those times in your life where you can remember exactly where you were when something happened, um, you know, like almost like a smell that brings you back in the day. When I think about the first time I encountered Heidegger's question of being, I was in my dorm or I was living off campus in my bed in this old apartment that we had where I really don't remember too much else from the apartment. This one time, this experience when I was uh, reading through this and I've been at that point, I was uh, been come across political theory, you know, uh, Locke, Hume and uh, Rousseau and was looking at, at the ancients and Plato and Aristotle. And they all were asking questions of, uh, you know, the good, what is the good, the true, the beautiful, what is justice, what are essences, things of that nature. And uh, Heidegger's idea of, hey, we need to take it back even further and ask what is being um, that had a just a, a huge impact on me. Um, but anyways, as I'm working through it, I came across this book that I haven't read through in a while. And uh, again, it's called Existentialism from Dostoevsky to Sartre by Walter Kaufman. And it treats these authors in terms of existentialists, um, Dostoevsky, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Rilke, Kafka, Ortega, Jaspers, Heidegger, Sartre, and Camus. And I don't remember reading this first um, article on Dostoevsky. And I'm very, very new to Dostoevsky in general. I'm really just starting to wrestle with his work. So I figured I'd read this first one here. And um, I had the idea, maybe I'll read it and record it. Um, so I can share it with others. Maybe they uh, would appreciate that. So I'm also trying a new rig here. I have a kind of a, a pop filter here and trying to work out the gains and things of that nature and, and how far away I can be from the mic where it doesn't sound too weird or I come in and out of focus uh, like that. So um, if uh, you're interested, please stick around. I'm going to read this first article, which is or this first uh, essay entitled Exist Existentialism from Dostoevsky to Sartre. And I'm really interested in this first part on Dostoevsky. And we can kind of go from there and make sure this is the right one here. Yeah, this is it. Okay. So we'll just get started here. Um, existentialism is not a philosophy, but a label for several widely different revolts against traditional philosophy. Most of the living quote unquote existentialists have repudiated this la la label and a bewildered outsider might well conclude that the only thing they have in common is a marked aversion for each other. To add to the confusion, many writers of the past have frequently been hailed as members of this movement and it is extremely doubtful whether they would have appreciated the company to which they are consigned. In view of this, it might be argued that the label existentialism ought to be abandoned altogether. Certainly existentialism is not a school of thought nor reducible to any set of tenets. The three writers who appear invariably on every list of existentialists are Jaspers, Heidegger, and Sartre are not in agreement on essentials. Such alleged press, uh, precursors as Pascal and Kierkegaard differed from all three men by dedicating Christians, by dedicated Christians. And Pascal was Catholic of sorts, while Kierkegaard was a Protestant, Protestants Protestant. If, as if often done, Nietzsche and Dostoevsky are included in the fold, we must make room for an impassioned anti-Christian and an even more fanatical Greek Orthodox Russian imperialist. 
By the time we consider adding Rilke, Kafka, and Camus, it becomes plain that one essential feature shared by all these men is their preferred individualism. The refusal to belong to any school of thought, the repudiated the repudiation of the adequacy of any body of beliefs, whatever of beliefs, whatever, and especially of systems, and a marked dissatisfaction dissatisfaction with traditional philosophy as a superficial, academic, and remote from life, that is the heart of existentialism. Existentialism is a timeless sensibility that can be discerned here and there in the past, but it is only in recent times that it has hardened into a sustained protest, protest and a preoccupation. It may be best to begin with the story of existentialism before attempting further generalizations. An effort to tell this story with a positivist's penchant for particulars and relentless effort to suppress one's individuality would only show that existentialism is completely uncongenial to the writer. This is not meant to be a defense of arbitrariness. A personal perspective may suggest one way of ordering diffuse materials and be fruitful, if only by way of leading others to considered dissent. Part one, Dostoevsky. In some of the earliest philosophers, such as Pythagoras and Heraclitus and Empodocles, we sense a striking unity of life and thought. And after the generation of the sophists, Socrates is said to have brought philosophy down to earth again. In the Socratic schools and in Stoicism a little later, philosophy is above all a way of life. Throughout the history of philosophy, other more or less similar examples come to mind, most notably Spinoza. It is easy and it was long fashionable to overestimate the beautiful serenity of men like these, and it is well to recall the vitriolic barbs of Heraclitus, the inimitable sarcasm of Socrates, and the passions of Spinoza. Even so, it is an altogether new voice that we hear in Dostoevsky's notes from underground. The pitch is new, the strained protest, the self-preoccupation. To note a lack of serenity would be ridiculous. Poise does not even remain as a norm, not even as an element of contrast. It gives way to poses, masks, the drama of the mind that is sufficient to itself, yet conscious of its every weakness and determined to exploit it. What we perceive is an uh, unheard of song of songs on individuality, not classical, not biblical, and not at all romantic. No, individuality is a retouched, idealized, or holy. It is not retouched, idealized, or holy. It is wretched and revolting, and yet, for all its misery, the highest good. The bias against science may remind us of romanticism, but the notes from underground are deeply unromantic. Nothing could be further from the softening of the contours which distinguished all romantics from the first attack on classicism uh, to Novalis, Keats, and Wordsworth. Romanticism is flight from the present, whether into the past, the future, or another world, dreams or most often a vague fog. It is self-deception. Romanticism yearns for a deliverance from the cross of the here and now. It is willing to face anything but the facts. The atmosphere of Dostoevsky's notes is not one of soft voices and dim lights. The voice could not be shriller, the light not more glaring. No prize, however, can justify an ounce of self-deception or a small departure from the ugly facts. And yet this is not literally, literary naturalism with its infatuation with material circumstances. It is man's inner life, his moods, anxieties, and his decisions that are moved into the center until, as it were, no no scenery at all remains. This book published in 1864 is one of the most revolutionary and original works of world literature. If we look for anything remotely similar to the long past of European literature, we do not find it in philosophy, but most nearly in such Christian writers as Augustine and Pascal. Surely the differences are far more striking even here than any similarity, but it is in Christianity against the background of belief in original sin that we first find this wallowing in man's depravity and this uncompromising concentration on the dark side of man's inner life. 
in Rousseau's, in Rousseau's confessions too, his Calvinistic background has to be recalled, but he turned against it and denied original sin, affirmed the natural goodness of man, and blamed his depravity on society. Then he proceeded to explain how all depravity could be abolished in the good society ruled by the general will. In Dostoevsky's Notes from Underground, No Good Society Can Rid Man of Depravity. The book is, among other things, an inspired polemic against Rousseau and the whole tradition of social philosophy from Plato and Aristotle through Hobbes and Locke to Bentham, Hegel, and John Stuart Mill. The man whom Dostoevsky has created in his in this book holds out for what traditional Christianity has called depravity, but he believes neither in original sin nor in God, and for him, man's self-will is not depravity. It is only perverse from the point of view of rationalists and others who value neat schemes over above the rich texture of individuality. Dostoevsky himself was a Christian, to be sure, and for that matter, also a rabid anti-Semite, anti-Catholic, and anti-Western Russian nationalist. We have no right whatsoever to attribute to him the opinions of all of his most interesting characters. Unfortunately, most readers fail to distinguish between Dostoevsky's views on those and the Grand Inquisitor in Ivan's story, The Brothers Karamazov, though it is patent that this figure was inspired by the author's hatred of the Church of Rome, and many critics take for Dostoevsky's reason judgments the strange views of Kirilov, though he is mad. As a human being, Dostoevsky was a fascinating as any of his characters, but we must not ascribe to him who, after all, believed in God, the outlook and ideas of his underground man. I can see no reason for calling Dostoevsky an existentialist, but I do think that part one of Notes from Underground is the best overture for existentialism ever written. With in inimitable vigor and finesse, the major themes are stated here that we can recognize when reading all the other so-called existentialists from Kierkegaard to Camus. All right, that, that's the part on Dostoevsky. Next is Kierkegaard, but I really want to stick with Dostoevsky, so I'm going to stick, get to the next chapter here uh, on notes from the underground here. All right, a little background on Dostoevsky. So, um, Fyodor Mikhailovich Dostoevsky was born in Moscow in 1821. His Notes from Underground was first published in 1864 and followed in rapid succession by Crime and Punishment, The Idiot, The Possessed, and The Brothers Karamazov. When he died in 1981, he was a national hero. In the Western world, he became a major, major influence only after the First World War. But Nietzsche read Notes from the Underground in 1887 and wrote, quote, I did not even know the name of Dostoevsky just a few weeks ago. An accidental reach of the arm in a bookstore brought to my attention Le Esprit Souterrain, a work just translated into French. The instinct of kinship, or how should I name it, spoke up immediately. My joy was extraordinary, close quote. The part here reprinted Nietzsche characterizes as really a piece of music, very strange, very un-Germanic music, and goes on to speak of, quote, a kind of self-derision of the, of the gnosto, the known thyself, close quote. Incidentally, these Greeks have a lot on their conscience. Falsification was their true trade. The whole of European psychology is sick with Greek superficiality, and without that, a little bit of, and without that, a little bit of Judaism, et cetera, et cetera. Actually, sorry, that was the close of the quote there. The final point of this first enthusiastic reaction on a postcard to a friend requires comment. It was the Old Testament that Milton cited in Arepagogitia when he argued against the Platonic conception of reason and of virtue enforced by law and censorship to propose instead that, quote, reason is but choosing, close quote. What Milton demanded was freedom, choice, decision. Kierkegaard's revolt against philosophy is similarly motivated. Even where he thinks that he is arguing against Hegelianism, he is often in rebellion against the whole Greek philosophic heritage, against the Greek image of man. Dozens of other themes are sounded in these pages too. 
reading how the underground man could not even, quote, could not even become an insect, close quote, we think of Kafka's metamorphosis. The analysis of resentment is developed by Nietzsche. Section six anticipates the psychology of Sartre's, quote, portrait of the anti-Semite, close quote. These are but a few examples. Notes from the underground has two parts of which only the first is offered here. The second, which is longer, recites some incidents out of the narrator's earlier life. These incidents do, care, do not explain how he became the way he is, but illustrate his character and some of his observations in part one. Like most of Dostoevsky's writings, part two is eminently worth reading, but it does not greatly add to the thought content of part one. To cut up a work of fiction might be barbarous, but what is here reprinted is much less like fiction than stylistically too, like Kierkegaard's reflections on himself, which follow, and like Rilke's note, uh, notes of Malte Lard's bridge offered later. The final page of part one has been omitted because it marks the transition to part two. Otherwise, the text is uncut. You know what, I'm gonna leave it there for now. Uh, if you guys wanna hear, so the next 30 pages is actually excerpt from Notes from Underground from Dostoevsky. Um, I'll probably read it. If you guys want to hear that reading, let me know. Um, if not, I'll just I'll leave this here as an introduction to the book. Again, it is hard to find. Existentialism from Dostoevsky to Sartre, um, selected and introduced by Walter Kaufman. All right. Thanks for listening. Take care.